Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Welcome to Vox Novus, the new voice. Was there a real Camelot with Arthur, Guinevere, and Merlin? What may a study of this magical time teach us about life, the feminine and masculine energies that each of us embody, and healing our world in a time that desperately needs it? My guest this week on Vox Novus, Marguerite Riglioso, shares her path and connection to that magical energy and the lessons therein for humanity and especially the empowerment of women. Marguerite Rigoglioso is the founding director of the Seven Sisters Mystery School, author of three books, including her best-selling The Mystery Tradition of Miraculous Conception, Mary and the Secret of Virgin Births, and has taught unique, leading-edge courses on the sacred feminine and women's spiritual leadership at various universities and graduate schools in the San Francisco Bay Area and at Canterbury Christ Church University in the United Kingdom. Her website is sevensistersmysteryschool.com, and she joins me this week to share her path and groundbreaking course starting this month, Heal Yourself and Our World by Reclaiming Guinevere, Arthur, the Fay, and the Round Table. Please join me in welcoming back to Vox Novus, Marguerite Rigoglioso. Welcome, Marguerite. Oh, it's so nice to be here, Victor. Thank you so much for having me again. And you are unveiling an exciting new course this month that will focus on uncovering hidden mysteries regarding King Arthur, Queen Guinevere, and the Court of Avalon. Please share with our audience how they may find out more about this course. Yes, so they can go to my website, sevensistersmysteryschool.com. The seven is written out, S-E-V-E-N, and it's all over the homepage. It's on the under the online courses tab. Um, and you can click onto that page, find out all about this course. There are several free videos that we're making available to give you teasers uh, for it. And you can register um, and join us live for four weeks in June going into July. And then, of course, it will remain available far beyond this into on into the future and definitely on demand. So that's that's how people can locate it and find out more and that's obviously what we're going to talk about today and it starts on june 15th is that correct yeah uh yes june 15th correct and it runs four wednesdays live or it is available in replay if you cannot make the classes live wonderful wonderful what inspired your interest in the legend of avalon you know like so many people when I started hearing these stories, what, as a child, maybe as an adolescent, about King Arthur, Queen Guinevere, Lancelot, you know, the Knights of the Round Table, Merlin, my ears perked up. Ooh, what is that? And eventually, somewhere along the way, I don't even know how, I started reading about it. And then when I went to the California Institute of Integral Studies, which was my full entry into the mystery traditions, I began to hear more and more about these great beings. And as I began to work on the inner planes myself through the use of various um, consciousness expanding sacred medicines, I began to have direct encounters with these beings or with knowings that seemed to come. For example, I had the experience during these ceremonies that I would do roughly every four to eight weeks, um, that Merlin, that great mage, magician of the Arthurian times, a great advisor to King Arthur, was appearing to me. And he it's not like I saw him, but I had the sense of knowing that he was teaching me again on the esoteric level, 
particular teachings of him uh, coming from him had to do with the paradoxical, strange and interesting nature of time, for example. So there were, there were a number of strains of teaching that were coming in from him. And then at some point, as I was going deeper into the investigation of divine birth, and as I began to read about King Arthur's very interesting conception, Merlin's own very interesting conception, and the strange, unfulfilled interaction between Arthur and Guinevere, as I began to then deeply read that material, I began to understand, oh my goodness, this is another case of divine birth gone right and gone wrong. And why do I know so much about that? And what I began to experience in these sessions is that I was deeply connected with Guinevere, if you will, an emanation of her. So that is not to say I am the reincarnation of Guinevere. <laughs> um, it is to say that these great beings are able to act in a holographic way with humanity and be available to each person on an individualized basis. When, when these beings cross over, when, when they are so big, um, they, like Mary Magdalene, like Jesus, like Mother Mary, and so forth, and there are connections, by the way, between Arthur and, and Guinevere and Mother Mary and Jesus, and etc. When these beings cross over, they kind of fractalize, okay? And that is how they become available to many, many people. And it's as though pieces of their soul can incarnate in different individuals. And I feel or sense that that has happened for me with Guinevere. So I've been able to, on some level, access varying aspects of her beingness, her personality, her lifetime that we knew her of as Guinevere, um, and be able to fill in some of the pieces of the story, which I then continue to do through my continued reading of these situations, and then my own going into my own oracle spaces about it. And that's what is going to be informing this book. I'm not only reading the academic material about it, which of course gets very dry and tries to really disappear them. But I'm reading about what some of the other great oracles on the planet have been saying about them that spark my own knowing. And I'm going to be weaving all of that together in this course and allowing people to get some of the unusual information that they might not find elsewhere that only I can bring in because of you know these pieces that I have. And also allow people to have direct experiences of some of the concepts that we're going to be talking about that were embedded into the age of Avalon. And we're going to be touching on a lot of these aspects during the course of this interview. But I remember in 1969, the Moody Blues came out with an album called On the Threshold of a Dream. And there was a song written and performed by the leader, Justin Hayward. And the lyrics said, right along the winds of time and see where we have been, the glorious age of Camelot when Guinevere was queen. Are you sitting comfortably? Let Merlin cast his spell. The legend of Avalon is timeless, romantic, and magical. But who really were King Arthur, Queen Guinevere, and Merlin? Were they actually real people? Right. First of all, Victor, I basically just want to weep hearing those lyrics. And another song is the Crosby, Stills, and Nash song, Guinevere. Had green eyes like yours, my lady, like yours. <laughs> That's right. And I just obsessively listened to that song because it, it evokes something, right? Mm -hmm. What it evokes is a deep memory that so many of us have of an actual age, an actual human age like Atlantis, like Lemuria, um, you know, these, these mystical space times, place times, whether they walk the planet or not, personally, I believe they did. I also believe that they are bigger than their human bodies and forms. Just like I believe Jesus and Mary Magdalene and Mother Mary walked the planet, 
and they are bigger than their human forms and they were in the process of a very great soul evolution for themselves and they were in a very great teaching role for humanity so that's how i see guinevere arthur merlin and you know others from that time very great great beings and the thing about them though is like jesus and mary they were just not the usual kind of human they already were coming in from star lineages let's say and in the case of Guinevere in particular, possibly also Arthur, they were coming in from what we would call she lineages, S-I-D-H-E, the she, the tall elves of Tolkien. This is a race of interdimensional beings that are soul kin with humanity. They are our collective ancestors. They are connected to the stars and they're deeply connected to the earth plane. They are considered shining ones. Sometimes they are called shining ones, a name that you will find in many, many cultures for the great beings that have been teachers and founders for us. So I believe that Guinevere and Arthur were part of this larger, almost original human form kind of incarnation into the planet. They carried all those codes and they were trying to help humanity stay afloat at a time when there were deep negative things happening on the planet to dumb down humanity, make us forget our magical connection with the she, and to make us lose our own larger than life magical abilities. They were there trying to help us hold on, but they could not withstand the sheer gale force wind of what was going on on the planet. And they lost the grasp of the planet for the fairies, the fae, the she, the realities of magic. And we went into a kind of a dark age after that, from which we are now emerging. In your research, what's new that you've uncovered about them? So one of these things is that I am following on the work of Wendy Berg in her book, Red Tree, White Tree, that Guinevere was what we would call a fairy queen. And already people hearing that word, oh, you know, fiction. No, these were these real human cousins. This is a race of beings that is very high level, fifth dimensional, if you will, and that she was from that realm. She, she was coming in at a time when the veils were getting thicker, when fifth dimensional fairy she beings and third dimensional humans were becoming further and further apart. The veils were getting thicker. The negative beings were taking over. She was coming in. She was trying to inculcate herself into the human family again to stir up another lineage of human beings that were human fairy hybrids. But the situation was not successful, okay, as I've said. But that's one of the things. How and why Guinevere was a fairy queen, what she was supposed to have accomplished and was not able to in the conception realm. That's one thing we're looking at that's new. We're going to be looking deeply at King Arthur's own divine conception and Merlin's divine conception and be able to make sense of that now in the context of the research I've done on divine birth, because these things are mentioned offhand. They are glancingly, um, you know, alluded to, but nobody's really been able to make sense of what it all is. And by me injecting in all of this information about divine birth, then we are going to be able to understand the age of Avalon, the age of Camelot in an entirely new way, and also connected in with the Christed Marian, the Christ Sophia mission. My guest, Marguerite Rigoglioso. Marguerite, please tell our listeners about this class that you have coming up this month. Yes, it's called Heal Yourself and Our World by Reclaiming Guinevere, Arthur, the Fae, and the Round Table. 
And this is something that you can access by visiting sevensistersmysteryschool.com, taking a look, registering for it, and joining us. Back on Box Novus, my guest this week, Marguerite Rigoglioso. We're talking about her mystery school and this wonderful class that's coming up focusing on King Arthur, Queen Guinevere, and the Court of Avalon. Why do you feel that these new revelations are important, especially now? I think, Victor, that, that these revelations are actually critical for us at this pivotal time in human history. We have all been through quite the journey over the last two years. That is a mystery school initiation in and of itself for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And so this course is really aiming for those people who are awakening through the great travails that we've been experiencing on the planet, which are far more than just a seeming illness set about by mother nature and a seeming remedy set about by the pharmaceutical industry, okay? There are much, much deeper things going on here. Enter the reawakened Guinevere and Arthur. There is a beautiful oracle on this planet named Lisa Renee, who basically alludes to the ancient story that Arthur was only sleeping, that he was going to wake up again, which means that the entire Holy Avalonian retinue was going to wake up, Guinevere included, that he was in state, and, and Lisa Renee says that literally he was in stasis in some kind of interdimensional domain where he was at rest until the time when he was needed again. This is the time, all right? This is the time of the great conflagration on the earth where it's sink or swim, you know, we're going to either awaken or we're going to get plunged back even more deeply into a dark age, but I think we're awakening. But Arthur and Guinevere are here as some of the guides that are here to help us. It is important that we know about them in their exalted form, that we know about some of the secrets that have traditionally not been seen or have been glossed over about them, that we rewrite their stories so that when we see them, we're seeing them in their glory so that we can see ourselves in our glory. And it's very important that we understand some of the technologies that they used, like the round table, like the grail, like the castle, in order to have those experiences of soul deepening and soul awakening ourselves. This is the time. Let's look a little more closely at Guinevere. She seems a bit shadowy in comparison to Arthur in the literature, and she's also portrayed in something of a negative light. What have you discovered about her? Right. Well, I've discovered that her name, actually, when you translate it down, it means dazzling supernatural being. Now, sometimes this is translated as the white enchantress, the white ghost, the white shadow. No, let's leave alone these diminishing terms, phantom, shadow, specter, etc. No, she was a dazzling supernatural being. She was a she. She was a fae, a fairy. She was a, a great queen. And that's the basis, um, you know, from which we will build our understanding of Guinevere to understand what then happened to her and what do we need to clear off, clean off, resurrect and heal about her and for her, for ourselves as well. Because as we do that, we, we are raising ourselves up. This is related to what's been happening with Mary Magdalene over the past decades. Mary Magdalene initially presented to us as a woman with seven demons who was a prostitute. Okay, how is that helping us? Um, you know, when we started to look at her in a much deeper level, find these gospels that were written by her or about her, we understand that she's a great high priestess. 
When we also start looking at her in the inner planes, we understand that, you know, she's, she's an, an Egyptian high priestess of Isis. She knew all of the mysteries of, of, of anointing. She was a specialized um, student and even helper of Jesus, may have even been his consort, his wife, etc. As we have been raising her up, we have been raising the entire sacred feminine up and all women which is something that absolutely needs to be done on the planet right now. We need to clear up and clean up these stories. So that's just giving you a little taste of what we're going to be looking at with Guinevere. Has their collective legend been distorted by, unfortunately, members of my gender? You know, Victor, no. I think the legend has been distorted by the interdimensional beings that try to control the human being and the human form. And they tend to come in through um, a distortion of the feminine. They themselves are already separated from and distorted from the feminine, trying to keep her down on the interdimensional level. And so when they come in and they are working with the male, female human forms and psyches, they are tending toward the masculine they are tending to um, give the masculine more powers, but also distort the masculine powers. And then the humans sort of follow from that, but humans don't always realize what's ailing them, what's governing them, what's controlling them. So it's not men per se. It's Everything that's been afoot on this planet that has caused these distortions, this skewing in the direction of the masculine, out of balance with the feminine, and this is part of what we're what we are clearing up. Tell us more about the fairies, the fae, who they are, and why people are talking more about them now. As I alluded to earlier, the fairies, the fae, the she. And there are many races of them. There are the sylphs, the gnomes, the um, brownies, the <laughs> pixies, you know, all of these different types of beings. They are our interdimensional cousins, our precursors. According to these histories that are coming out now, they, they were here first you know, they, they more have the energy of a light being. And at some point, this divide started where they decided to remain in the higher dimensional realms, fifth and, and higher, if you will. And the hum there's, a, there's a strain of them that decided to continue going deeper and deeper into third dimensional reality. And then, then the split happened. But they are very strongly connected with the natural world, you know, the environment. They're also strongly connected with the inner earth, what we might call the inner earth, the inner planes, as well as literally physically the inner earth. It is said that at a certain point, the Tuat de Danan in Ireland, which is one of the names, and, and the, the British Isles, which is one of the names that's given to these people, the Tuat de Danan, that there was a certain war that went on on the planet and they they had to go hidden they could no longer be showing themselves on the earth plane so they went inside the earth that's how they were described as going inside the earth does that mean literally physically does that mean into the inner dimensions perhaps both and but they continue to be our allies they are partly us. They are rooting for us. They are wanting us to come back and move into our higher dimensional consciousness. They are wanting us to take better care of this earth, not destroy all of the earth forms that are needed for their magical energy to stay alive. The trees, the lakes, the mountains, the you know, the metal deposits, the crystals, the flowers, all of that. They, uh, connecting with them is vital to the survival of the human race and the health of this planet. So it's both practical and magical. 
There are those who frequently see balls of light or orbs, uh, sometimes referred to as earth lights. Are those manifestations of the Fae? I believe so, yes. And I've seen people who shown me films and photos that they've taken of such phenomena. Um, this one particular woman that I, I did, um, I gave her some intuitive sessions. She showed me these films of um, these balls of light coming out of a base of a tree. And then when she's able to close up on them, you can see a little being in them. It's got wings and so forth. Mm. And I mean, I totally trust this woman. She's not manipulating this, you know. Um, there, there are other examples of such things. Yes, the balls of light frequently are related to these fae. They may also be related to other phenomena, some friendly, some not friendly. But I think we can say that um, in many instances, yes, that is how they are showing up. And in the class that you have starting on June 15th, are you going to talk about connecting with the Fae? Absolutely, yes. We're going to talk about practicing how to see them, as well as working with them, in particular, the leprechaun race. Okay, now they've been cutified and turned into lucky charms and, you know, I mean, crazy things like that. But we're looking at these leprechauns as manifestations of the manifestation magic itself. The richness, the ability to create wealth, that this is what the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is associated with them. So we're going to be working with them, working with creating altars, you know, understanding them at deeper and deeper levels. And this course is just the start for people to be able to have the tools and the pathways to go in more deeply well after the course by, you know, going into meditation with these beings, by asking for signs, by working in their own sacred medicine realms and turning their mind to them and then receiving direct information. You know, we're all in the, in the process of co co-manifesting this, co-creating this. So it's a very, very exciting kind of course that, that we're embarking upon. You had alluded to this a little earlier. What's the connection between Arthur and Jesus, and how does this relate to our lives today? As I have come to understand it, Arthur and Jesus are iterations of one another. Whether it's that Arthur came first in the lineage, which is what some people say, even based on the prehistory, that he's a prehistorical figure, meaning that he would have been around prior to the advent of Jesus, or whether he walked the planet in 500 AD or the 5th century, whenever it is approximately around then, um, they seem to be of the same brotherhood. They are carrying some of the same energies. Now, granted, there's a lot of historical documentation that Arthur was warring and killed all these people, blah, blah, blah. Um, we don't know on which level that warfare was going on. Was it physical or was it an astral kind of warfare where the guy was trying to protect the Earth plane from these negative forces, okay, and or, you know, or what? Whatever the case may be. We understand Arthur when those of us who tune into him, which is why he's so beloved, as the benevolent masculine. You had asked earlier, do you think that, you know, the males of our species have distorted all these stories in the feminine? Well, not necessarily, but they became distorted, just like the feminine has, be everyone's become distorted. And Arthur was carrying a, a strain of the undistorted masculine, you see. And that's what we're going to be looking at as well in this course. How do we find out more about that? How do we cultivate it? What does it look like, feel like in our lives? What does it feel like for men to be that masculine? What does it feel like for women to receive that masculine? And how is this connected with the Jesus energy of the sacred heart? The, the, the love energy that is the thing that is going to get us through this time of travail, and that is the whole purpose of this initiation, is to go into deeper levels of love. That's why this is all relevant today. It, it's, it's all happening now. These initiations, 
And therefore, we are calling on these beings to help us. Is it time for us as a society, as a race, to create our own round table and find sacred community within? Yes, absolutely. And we're going to be looking at what is this round table? You know, when you look at it with a, a thick head, <laughs> you're thinking, wow, this was a really large oak table who could, you know, seat 100 people. It may have been, but it's always talked about as um, something you could also carry in your pocket. <laughs> so how could it be both? Hmm, there's a paradox. And whenever you're faced with paradox, you can go right into an initiation if you can embrace both at the same time, right? So yes, it's a large table where in the three-dimensional reality, we can all sit at it. And what does it mean? It means we're all equal. It means there's no hierarchy. It's not a pyramid. It's a circle, which is very feminine. Everyone is at the head of the table. And from here, in this circular format, we can come to agreements. We can create laws. We can do um, healings. You know, we can decide what we need, what the people need, and so forth. Back on Vox Novus, my guest this week, Marguerite Rigoglioso. We're talking about the Seven Sisters Mystery School and the class that she has starting on June 15th about the Court of Avalon, the Avalonian Mysteries, and the healing that can be found with this wonderful information. So what is the truth about the Holy Grail? What is the Grail, and why should we embrace this? Right. You know, the Grail is one of those things that it resonates at the level at which you are. So how I am holding the Holy Grail is that it is the connection with the deep inner feminine. And it is the restoration within of that sacred feminine energy, wh whatever gender you are. And it is the connectivity to the supreme divine through that connection. So it can be seen as a chalice, a womb. It can be seen as something to achieve or find or locate or restore or get back as something that was stolen, or it can be seen as something that is already within you. There's no seeking that needs to happen. There's just an understanding and an appreciation, and therefore a working with the grail within. That's how I see it. It, it is the symbol and the energy of your own aspect of divinity. And it implies, if I'm hearing you correctly, that we're talking about the balance between the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Yeah, the yin and the yang. Yeah, the womb and the lingam. All of this is what's wanting to come together now, the sacred marriage. Which leads us to talk about Christ Sophia consciousness. What is that? This is the expression of the totality of the divine. When we only talk about the Christ energy, we're in the skew toward the masculine. We, we have to unite it with the Sophia, which is the divine feminine energy of it, in order to have the full enchilada, if you will, okay? We're needing that full enchilada right now, because as I said earlier, we all know We've been in a distorted time where everything's really leaned toward the masculine and a distorted masculine, not because men caused it, but because we all got victimized by this, all right? We're having to lean back in the other direction, restoring the sacred feminine so that we can have this weave together. This is what's going to create the wholeness within. This is what's going to lead us into 
harmony between men and women. And it's what, what's going to lead us into the new earth that, that we're talking about, that a lot of people are talking about, where many of us are dwelling on a higher dimensional frequency, even while being in three dimensions, which we will likely remain, but we will be able to have a different quality of experience on the earth plane, one that is much more positive and happy, that is returning us, restoring us to the ancient energies of Lemuria, of Eden, and so forth. And I don't mean this as pie in the sky. I mean this as like, we can have that reality. You know, it's a, it's one of the negative programs that, oh, well, this is just the way it is. And that's life and da, da, da. You can never really be happy. Well, no, you can never really be happy in a world in which these negative forces are doing what they've been doing which was part of what Arthur was trying to stave off and Jesus was trying to help us transmute out of, we can have it again. And it's very important for us to start visualizing that reality because in doing so, we're going to be creating it. And that's another aspect of this course. It's going to be planting more and more seeds for that, for all of us to be able to, because what you, what you look at expands. What you focus on becomes your reality. So we want to go into that reality of Eden. And as you said, restore the Eros Gamos sacred marriage. That's right. That is a very critical component because relations between men and women have gone sour. They've gone south. Men and women have been torn asunder. I mean, there's been so much fighting, negativity, sexual misery programming for centuries and centuries and centuries. Um, we can talk about all the heinous abuses that have happened, um, and in particular to the feminine, but it's, it's everyone. And again, this wedge between the genders is one of the things that I believe has been inserted by these negative forces to separate us out, create misery on the planet, because the misery is the food for these people. You know, the misery is the food for these beings. It's just a food chain type of thing. And we're saying we're stopping being your food. You know, we want to restore our original harmony. And men and women getting along, loving each other, being able to, if they wish, have lifelong, beautiful, constantly regenerating marriages and partnerships is our birthright. We can have that and we need to start visualizing this again and start manifesting it again. And how may we pass this knowledge to our children? We may pass this knowledge to our children by living it, by breathing it, by talking about it, you know, through example, that's always how things are passed through children. It's through example. Teaching children is its own mystery school, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I think sometimes we learn more from them than they do from us. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because a lot of them are coming in as such elevated star beings now. I mean, it's fast and furious. So we've got a lot of um, higher vibrational souls that are like, dive, dive, dive. Now is the time. We've got to get in those human women and help turn this ship around. And, you know, so some of it's happening spontaneously and some of it is happening through conscious conception and some of it is happening through the restoration of divine birth, which is you and I talked about that last time with Mother Mary. And that is going to be an element that we're looking at in the mysteries of Avalon. If you had one message for everyone out there, what would it be? Love one another. And we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Oh, absolutely, 100%. Please share with our listeners about this wonderful course that starts on June 15th, how listeners may register and what the offerings will include. Yes. So they can go to sevensistersmysteryschool.com. The seven is written out, S-E-V-E-N. And you can see on the homepage and, um, that we are mentioning this course. Click on to that link. And you'll go to the page that tells you all about what people can expect in this course. 
that we are going to be drawing the links between Christ Sophia consciousness, the Essenes, Guinevere and Arthur, the court of Avalon and the fairy kin, that this is going to inspire people um, through transmissions they're going to receive to power their own spiritual mission. And we're, you know, it, it's going to happen both through the awakening when you're going to receive information about Guinevere and Arthur as fairy, about Arthur as divinely born king, about restoring the sacred marriage template, as well as, you know, the role of divine birth in Avalon, the round table technology. It, learning those things intellectually is going to seed you and spark you, but we're also going to be going through experiential exercises that, that are going to take you deeper and that are going to be the real takeaway of the course so that you can go on into the future, continuing to develop these soul qualities and abilities and so that you can continue to access your own knowledge directly into the Akashic records, as we call them, the wisdom uh, womb of all creation. What's next on your personal path of discovery? <laughs> well, this summer, I plan to complete my second book on Mother Mary. As a mentor, a womb master, a healer, um, and, uh, you know, just a role model for all of us today so that we can continue to elevate ourselves and go through our spiritual awakening at this time. And then, you know, there's a, a long list of things that I've got going on with Seven Sisters Mystery School. So people can just sign up um, for our newsletter on the, on the webpage, sevensistersmysteryschool.com, and be kept abreast of everything. Marguerite Rigoglioso, thank you so much for joining us again and sharing this very important wisdom and message for our time. Victor, you are welcome, and thank you so much for having me and for all the beautiful work that you're doing. And thank you for joining us on Vox Nobis. I'm Victor, the Voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.